hope everybody is well this morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Let's uh, have uh, people file in. Uh, let's bow our heads and we'll ask God's blessing upon our time this morning. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we come to you through Jesus Christ, uh, Lord, our prophet, priest, and king, uh, Father, our brother, uh, Father, uh, the one with whom you deal with us, grace, with grace, with mercy, with compassion and love through him. And so, Father, we give you great thanks and praise this day that we may come to you in and through his work. We praise you, Father, that we have this wonderful, great privilege and duty to uh, lift praise to you, uh, to confess our sins as a people, uh, Father, to express our dependence completely upon you through Jesus Christ. And we ask, Father, that you would hear us and bless us from your word. Bless us, Father, in the hymns that we sing, the prayers that are lifted. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, in the preaching of the word that you would continue to build us up in our journey and sojourning here on earth, and that, Lord, you would ready us for the week to come. We pray for those, Lord, that are unable to be with us due to illness or travels. Uh, Father, we have many in this church that have uh, pressing physical issues, and we lift them up to you today and ask that you would put your hand of healing, your hand of comfort, uh, Lord, that you would encourage them from your word. Those traveling, Father, keep them safe and provide to them a a place this day in which they may worship you. Uh, Father, we ask that you would prepare our pastor, Jacob, in the leading of worship and the preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments. And Father, that we would, uh, by your mercy to us, tune our ears and eyes unto that work. And Father, we pray this all in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, before I read, I, I'd like to, uh, I, I was thinking about something that I would like to, we kind of talked about it last week, but uh, unfortunately I always feel the need to go backwards a little bit when I review stuff because I feel like maybe I've missed something or I'd like to make another point. I'd like you to, let's read verses 13 to the end of the chapter. Uh, and we'll begin and make a little backwards comment, so to speak, and then I also want to go back to Genesis chapter 15 after I make those comments. I want to review again. I think I want to apologize. I, I think I failed to really explore God's promise to Abraham last week. And, and I realized that talking to a few people and, and uh, meditating on what we did last week. So I want to go back to that and look at that and, and point out a little bit more <coughs> significance of that. So first let's read here at Hebrews verse 13. <clears throat> Pardon me. I've <clears throat> I've had a cold in my throat all week, so <clears throat> it's actually much worse than it sounds. No, it's a bad joke. <clears throat> uh, all right, verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of of Melchizedek. And let's turn back uh, to Genesis chapter 15. Uh, I read the whole chapter last week. I'd like to, for the sake of time, I would like to just read a portion of that chapter, starting at verse 12. So I'll, I'll preview this by said, 
you know, God has spoken to Abraham and made the promise, and Abraham has responded in, in a, not in a disrespectful or sinful way, but how am I to know this, Lord? So picking up at verse 12, after he had brought all these pieces and cut them in half and set them up as God had decreed, and the sun was, <coughs> was going down, and a deep sleep fell on Abram, <coughs> and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward <coughs> they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, uh, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphium, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. I like particularly Girgashites. That just sounds really good to me. <laughs> Always been one of my favorite sort of, uh, you know, tribes. All right, so... Uh, before we uh, before we jump in, okay, and I want to talk about what ha what's happening here in chapter 15 of Genesis a little bit. I I would like to make this comment about we talked a little bit about Abraham. Go back um, in verse in chapter six, and in verse <coughs> 15 it says, and thus Abraham, having <coughs> waited patiently, obtained the promise. <coughs> Waiting and patience. I am a self-confessed control freak. I don't know if anybody else uh, lives uh, like that in their lives. I like to be in control. I like to control uh, my, my environment, my situation, all that is going on around me. Is that a, uh, a realistic way to live? Anybody here experience the idea of being a control freak? Yeah, <laughs> I only saw a few hands, so I, it's okay if you didn't confess it openly. Um, you know, all right, it's okay. I'd rather not. <laughs> that, that that's a loaded statement, so we don't want to go there, right? Um, notice these two things here that are so important, and this is something I've been thinking about this past week. The concept of waiting and also the concept of patience, and of course they go together, right? Notice <coughs> what the activity, if we were to say the doing that Abraham did, what did he do? Don't say waiting and don't say patience, use something else. Say it louder, nothing. Well he did, but, but physically, he didn't do anything. Now, he did do something spiritually. What did he do? Faith, right? A faith that's also, we could say, hope. And, and you know, if you go to chapter 11 in Hebrews, where, which we will get to some, sometime down the road here, uh, you know, it defines what faith is, right? Anybody, anybody know that verse by heart in chapter 11? I'd like to say I do, but given today. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. That's what Abraham did. By the way, that's what we're all called to do too. Right. Yeah, Peter, go ahead.
think it's a very good point. Um, I mean, Proverbs, <coughs> Proverbs clearly says that it is a snare to fear men more than God. And, and so, and I don't think that's said because it's like a pie in the sky. Maybe somebody on the earth fears men more than God. I think it's a statement of that we all, in some form or fashion, more or less, uh, we are more concerned about what on earth people that see us than we are about how God looks down upon us. No doubt. And, and I think there is a connection. I thought when you said something, you were just going to say, I agree, you are a control freak. So uh, <laughs> thank you for not saying that. Um, uh, my, my, my point is this, is that it has caused a great deal of stress in my life because think about whether it be with my relationship with my wife or my children or in the workplace or issues in my home or in the church. It's forgetting who's in charge and what my primary duty is. And, and it's true, and I would just encourage you to really take this little, this is kind of a, almost an inconsequential in terms of reading this chapter in Hebrews. It is, you know, uh, he talks in 13 about God's promise, and because he had no one greater to swear by it, God swore by it himself and put himself on the sort of the documentation of signing who's responsible uh, to keep this promise. Abraham didn't sign anywhere, by the way, right? If you buy a house and borrow money, who does the signing? You do. Okay, notice, this is, Abraham, Abraham doesn't do any signing. He's not made responsible for this promise. He's made, he's made responsible for what? <laughs> Believing patiently, and a part of that patience is what? To wait. And by the way, let's go back to chapter 15. I saw your hand, Wes. Hang on just a second. Um, let's go back to chapter 15. I think this is really kind of interesting because he does say, even though we know that Abram is in a deep sleep and darkness has fallen upon him, isn't it interesting that God, in speaking to him, says what? They're going to be how long? 400 years. <laughs> would you uh, feel very warm and fuzzy about saying, hey, you know, you're not going to actually see any of this? Right? Isn't that kind of a, imagine how that can affect us. And yet it says in, in Hebrews that what did he do? He had that patience that allowed him to wait, to trust, to truly believe that what all of God said he would do would be done. So hang on a second, Chuck. Go ahead, Wes. That's right. And that's a great point. I'm going there, but I appreciate you bringing it up. There's no way that Abraham, and this, is, this goes back to my statement about being a control freak. I'm always reminded when things go awry in my seeking to control a situation, that I would have been better just not to get all uptight about it in the first place. Yeah, well, I, I'm just saying, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it has created a great deal of stress in my life because I'm putting myself where? I'm putting myself in God's place. And it's a horrible sin to commit. It really is. Because, you know, what does it say? We can't affect the days of our life, the hairs upon our head, right? Wait patiently, okay? And go ahead, Chuck. What were you going to say? Well, I, okay, so thank you. You, you ruined my whole point, Chuck, by saying that, right? Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, but actually, Ab Abram didn't li live 900 years, so it was a little bit shorter at the point, at that point in the history of Israel. Okay, any other comments or questions? That's just something that's been on my brain all week. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. That is a beautiful picture, and it's, uh, and it's one that's worth reminding. 
I want to make, so let's move on. I want to make one comment here about, first of all, this was an Old Testament system of, I mean, what I mean in this part of the history of the people, not just of Israel, but all of these tribes that are in this area at the time, this was a way to settle a matter, to cut, to, to cut pieces of animals in two, separate them, and to walk between them. And what does the oath mean? Some of you know, and this is what I was reminded of last week, that, I, that some of you, and probably all of you know this, but I just felt like I failed to, to underlie this as well as I should have. It means that if I don't keep this promise, this is what will happen to me. I will be put to death. Right? So I don't want to, I, I, some of you know that, but I, I felt like I failed to do that. Uh, if you want to, turn to the book of Ruth. And this one just, this one was one I wrote, made a note, but unfortunately what I did was is I fell, I failed to write it down. Um, chapter 4. This is another. This is another form of taking an oath. Okay, just to show you another picture of it. Okay, uh, let's just start at verse one. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken. This is the redeemer of Ruth. Okay, and if you don't remember or know about that, is is if a wife's husband. Uh, died. It was there was a quote unquote redeemer who was responsible for taking, marrying her, and caring for her. Okay, and and uh, let's see. And behold, the redeemer whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, "Turn aside, friend, and sit down here." And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, "Sit down here." So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer. Naomi has come back from the country of Moab, Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of these sitting here, in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Moses said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you shall you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So it's just a different form, but another, this is a, a promise made, an oath made, and this was just another picture of things that took place during this time. And so again, God is saying, if I don't keep my promise to you, Abram, this is what should, well, this is what is done to me, okay? Now it says, if you go back to Hebrews, I'm not done in Genesis just yet, but if you go back to Hebrews, <coughs> um, look at verse 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So I want to stop there. What are the two things that are unchangeable? Going back to Genesis chapter 15, what are the two things? The promise and the oath. So some people miss that. I want to make sure everybody sees that. First of all, by the way, let's pause for a second. Shouldn't God's promise be enough? This is kind of an interesting discussion. Shouldn't God's word be enough? Now, unlike Gideon, and I love the story of Gideon, right? You know, uh, the reason I like the story of Gideon is, is he seems to always be able to uh, get God to do what? Prove his word, right? 
he comes up with all these series. If you haven't read that story recently, I always encourage you to start read it again because he comes up with all these series of tests that God has to do, right? Uh, the one, my favorite one is, is, you know, make the dew fall uh, on, you know, everything but, right? And then he reverses it the next time. Uh, and he's, you know, Gideon's real unsure of God's promise. God, we talked about this condescension, and this making of an oath is a huge condescension for God. Why? Because his word should be enough. And so remember what this passage is for um, in Hebrews. Remember what we said is, is he's beating him over the head with a stick saying what? You're not grown up. You're not teachers. You need to be taught. You're children who can't eat solid food. You can only drink milk and you should be eating solid food. And you're going back to what? All these rules, regulations, ceremonies, washings, faith in a bad way, uh, eternal judgment, all these things that represent the Old Testament, you're going back. And I want to move forward if God will permit me. So he's really, he's really hit him hard. And he says, I don't think you're there yet. I have hope for you. And then this last passage is about what? This last passage is to give them some huge encouragement to press on, to endure the persecutions, to not turn back to Judaism. Why? How is this a huge, huge encouragement? ahead of me so great that's I no no don't apologize that's exactly right that's I mean what's the very next verse after this promise now Sarai's Sarai Abraham's wife had borne him no children she had a female servant whose name was Hagar uh oh <laughs> he's waiting and he's patient but you're right it's not perfect uh, anybody uh, I want to make one other comment you may not have picked up on this so um, uh, let's go back to Hebrews for a second. I'm flipping around, and I apologize for that. But I think this is really important. Uh, look at the beginning of chapter 6. I kind of mentioned this, okay? But I want to I make a little correlation that I think is, can slip by you that's, that's really full of promise here. And another thing that they probably, it was very subtle, but they should have picked up on the readers here. So in verses, um, in verses 1, of chapter 6, you know, it says, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not, a, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about washings, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And remember what we said about those things. Those represent the old way. Old Testament, right? All right now, what I'd like you to do is if you, if, then we have this in in 13 through the end of the chapter, this discussion of God's promise and the confirmation of that promise through this oath. Okay, so flip back to 15 if you would, please, just to look at it. This is before the giving of the law. Don't miss this. Why is this so important? Why is it so important that they recognize, here he's listed out in the beginning of six, hey, let's not go back to, boom, 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 these six things that lead to ultimately what? They're going to lead to their death. And in fact, he says a little bit later, what? Thorns and thistles ready to be burned. And then he comes over and talks about he has greater hope, and then he talks about this wonderful picture of God making a promise to Abraham and confirming it with the passing through of these split pieces, okay? Um, don't miss the fact that he made this promise long before what? 
500 years, 450 years, you can, you can correct me on my timing, but it's a long time before God gives the law to Moses on Sinai. And that's important because ultimately what these people want to return back to are, is what? We know it's dead. We've read the verse at the end of chapter 10 that it's, it's dying and soon to go away. But he's trying to show them and give them a great deal of hope that God's promise to save them, redeem them, and bring them to heaven is long before he gave the law to Moses and to the people of Israel after coming out of Egypt. In other words, it, it should, this, is, this is also pointed to that Abraham had faith, and his faith was long before what? Before the law was given. In other words, these people are resting on something that really has no foundation for their salvation. It's not going to get them there. And he wants to, that's a little subtle thing that I think, I know I missed it for many, many years until I studied Hebrews. That there's this very little subtle thing. Here's all these things that you've been doing and you want to go back to now. And oh, by the way, let's not forget that God did this long before the giving of the law. And that should give us hope because as, uh, you know, you said, he didn't do it perfectly, but he did it, but he did it by how? He did it by God's strength and grace in his life. Abram did nothing, right? He did nothing except to wait patiently. Okay, questions or comments about this? Anybody? All right, very good. Let's flip over to uh, Hebrews, back to Hebrews chapter 6. I'd like to, I might even, we might even get done a little bit early because I, I don't think I'm going to press into chapter 7 today, but I will say this, we need to wrap this up if we can. And I've been working, not looking at my notes, so let me just see if I've missed anything. So, I mean, again, I pointed this out, but this is a tremendous amount of grace that God is showing, uh, and we should see it too. Um, and we have the word, but he con condescends to also make the oath and make it a certainty. Um, to give us a, assurance to keep us from what? Wavering. Uh, we should not in any form or fashion. And the same is true for the promises that he's made to us in this day. So, so we, are, we are a part of the promise to Abraham made all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. But there are promises made in the New Testament that affect us directly too. In other words, we should be reminded, and we have, we have this history of the word of God that shows that all of God's promises are what? Yea and amen. And we should, no matter where we are, no matter how hard we're being pressed upon, no matter what difficulties and trials we face in this life, we need to, we need to always be doing what? It's, it's keeping our eyes from being down and keeping our eyes up, because we have those promises too. Peter. I haven't specifically made that point, but it is a point to be made. Uh, it, uh, yes, it is. I mean, uh, if you go, go over to chapter 11 uh, with me, and let's just read it. Um, verse 8, by faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive it as inheritance. He went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise 
in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By, and I'll just stop there. So there is, remember what we call this chapter, this is like the hall of fame of faith, right? And so, yes, um, <coughs> there's, uh, there is a great deal of admiration we should have for Abram, Abraham, whichever one you want to use. I'm going to use Abraham just because, uh, because uh, we're past when he was Abram. But Abraham had this tremendous amount of faith to, to wait patiently upon the promises, and he never saw them fulfilled, right? Okay, we, we have been the receivers of many of the promises that Abram or Abraham received, uh, they are fulfilled. Now, we have promises that that day is coming, right? And we are closer to it than Abraham, but we still have the same duty is to rest in the promises of God to know that they are true. But we have the benefit of something Abraham didn't have. We've seen the keeping of the promises, right? We've seen the, the, the possession of Israel. We've seen the defeat of all these nations. It's historically recorded, right? We've seen the coming of our Messiah. We've seen his death, resurrection, and ascension. We've seen uh, the word go out and many nations being blessed through that promise made to Abraham, right? Yeah. So, so we have a benefit, and that's why Abraham's faith is so significant, right? So, yeah, I think it's a great point. Anybody else? Okay. I'm sorry, Debbie. I, I, you're, you may have to stand up next yeah. time. I, I'm always looking out, so forgive me. Um, I was just very recently um, that we had the grace of God right before the commandments and the graces of the gift that God gave us to do. And, and that's what I was And that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, so... So, so, yeah, so let's be reminded, where do we first see God's grace, promise of salvation? Genesis, right, Genesis chapter 2, right? So I, I want to be very clear that this is just another picture of that, and what I wanted you to see here is they want to go back to something that, pr that is after God's promises and the oath made to Abraham. And so there's greater significance to God's promise than there is to a temporary means of living before God and other men, right? So what's the summary of the law? L you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, right? And your neighbor as yourself. And we talked about this two weeks ago. Uh, this, this was only to be a picture of how they not only needed to live, but how God would save them ultimately in Christ, right? But prior to giving all of that, God makes this promise. And yes, it, it's, it's a picture of grace, just like you said. Okay, moving on. Anybody else? Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's somewhat significant that the purpose of oaths in the Old Testament is, is to, be, to be used uh, not only in reverence before God, but to bring God honor and glory. Uh, that's the purpose of using an oath in the Old Testament. And so what's interesting is, is it may sound funny to say this, but in the giving and the, the, this oath made to Abraham, he is also doing what? He is bringing honor to and glory to his name, which I think is, is, uh, is an interesting concept to uh, consider. Uh, this, again, just only heightens and signifies what God did through the passing in between. One other side comment. Anybody notice the two things that pass between and, and draw any correlation? What passed between those cut up animals? A smoking pot and a flame. Think of anything? What did that represent? By the way, how did God show his presence to the Israelites as they marched out of Egypt and then ultimately through the desert and up the east side of Israel and going through all these countries because of 
failure to obey his promise about getting the land, right? How did he show his presence to them? Fire and smoke. Fire by night and smoke during the day. And it was, yes, to guide them, but more importantly, it, the significance is, is his presence. So don't, again, always try to take the time to look at all the little pieces to, to see the significance of these things, because you see them, usually you see them again somewhere in God's word. Um, uh, so looking at, uh, I got to get back to the right place, my apologies. Uh, so when God desired to show more convincingly, I want to look at this word desire, God intended that these people be extraordinarily encouraged by this promise. That was his desire in, and, and he, his, his initial desire was for Abraham. He desired, he wanted to encourage Abraham to continue what? Patiently waiting. We should be encouraged in the same way. And that's, that's what we're called to, by the way. We're called to be patiently waiting as we live each day of our lives. Um, and, and remember that this is a promise that's made to the Jews first. This is, this is what's interesting about this, is, is if you go back through Scripture, right, this promise that God made to Abraham was made first and foremost to the Jewish nation. Right? Romans chapter 9, 4, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. They were first in line to receive the benefit of everything promised to Abraham in this oath that was taken. Right? Um, uh, the, the Gentiles, which many of us are included, I mean, most of us are included in, uh, were brought in from the outside. And, of course, there are places in the Old Testament that see that. So I don't want to go too far with that. But his desire was to do what? To have this people that he had set apart to be for him and to be his and for him to take the glory. Uh, we know that, that, there, that this was his desire. And in trying to prove that desire is why he did this, uh, uh, made this promise. Further down it says that, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, um, not only did God make the promise, not only did he swear by it in an oath, okay, um, but we're being reminded here that he is unchanging, that his decrees are unchanging, that they will not change, nor can they be what? Thwarted. Go back to my opening comment about being a control freak. You know, not only did I want to control the situation, but 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, I never really got what I ultimately was trying to control, uh, which is laughable, right? And most people, particularly those of you that are older, know this. Those of you that are younger might have a little more, more learning to do. I don't know. But, but ultimately, the only person whose promises do not change is who? God. This is one of the reasons why last week we talked briefly about oaths, and we, we've been warned, and James says it, let your yes be yes and your no be no. But the warning about oaths is, is it's very hard for sinful man to keep his promise, right? And, and, but it's not hard at all for God to keep his promise. And as we read scripture, we should be encouraged about all the promises that we see. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is, uh, come to Jesus, whose burden is what? And yoke is, that's a promise. That's not just a statement, that's a promise to us, right? And, and we could go on. There, the, in the New Testament, we have all these promises that are built upon primarily what's going on in this chapter 15 and a little bit prior where God makes all these promises, particularly to Abraham. So, um, uh, in his promise, he reveals and guarantees not only himself, but his purpose for his people. Um, so look at 18. So that two unchangeable things in which is it impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. 
Uh, we talked about the two unchangeable things, the promise and the oath. Promise of blessing through salvation and his swearing to confirm it. What God says and what he swears is to is unchangeable. Just some verses, uh, Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in the furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Psalm 18, verse 30. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? How could these readers doubt the promises of God? And by the fact that it says that Abraham obtained the promise through waiting patiently, which we started with, what's interesting is, is we know that Abraham was what? He was convinced of the promise. Yes, Debbie's point is really great, and that's where I was going. Uh, at this point is, is, yeah, he didn't do it perfectly, and there is sin that we see in Abraham's life, right? But the point is, is that it is, he's convinced of it, but I want to make a, a point here. How is he convinced? He's not convinced because he did something. How did he become convinced? Faith. And who not only gave him his faith, but who increased his faith? God. This is one of the hardest things, I think, as believers that we struggle with every single day. And that is, is that we are at the mercy of God. Not only for our faith, but for its continual fueling, if I may say it that way. We go to the, we go to the I don't know how many times you go to in, each week to fill up your car with gas. But think about it. God not only provides the gas, but he makes sure that it gets put in the tank. We don't do either. And, and it's an amazing thing to, to comprehend. I, I'm always amazed by this, okay, uh, to think about how God does these things. Now, um, look, look further down. We're, run, we're just about out of time, and this is going to work out very well. Now, look what it says, 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. I want to stop there. Anybody here do boating? Anybody? Yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. It's bad enough to have me reverb. Um, I, I had the privilege of being taught to sail in open water by my father, uh, something that I enjoyed greatly and uh, was a ton of fun. And one of the things that we would do is, is you might, if you were out for a couple of days, you might pull into a, a harbor and you had to anchor the sailboat. And what's interesting about this is, is there's a picture here to be had. You don't see the anchor once you put it in. My wife's laughing about something that I won't bore you with, but she's, she's making me laugh. We had a terrible time on one trip trying to anchor the boat, but we won't get into that one right now. Um, think about it. You put the anchor in. I don't care how deep the water is. You drop the anchor. Do you see the anchor doing its work? You don't. It's a picture. We don't see the work, and oh, by the way, we, we don't even do the work. It's the anchor, and who's the anchor? I, I think you understand where we're going. I just thought it was a really cool picture, is that God is giving us this anchor that we don't control and is connected to us, and then move on. What's the other picture he gives us? We have not only this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. So what's that a picture of? Well, that's the Holy of Holies, right? How often did the high priest go into the Holy of Holies? Once a year, right? We talked, I think, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about there were several interesting things that went on with this, uh, like a rope tied around the ankles so that in case, uh, you know, the, God's judgment fell upon the high priest, somebody could retrieve the body, right? But think about it, is we have this access that he's going to dig into. As we get into seven and beyond, he's going to dig into this. And how do we have access? Last verse, this is what's going to lead us into this comment about Melchizedek, because where 
Okay, so who's the sure and steadfast anchor of our soul? Jesus. Who is given us access into the inner place? Jesus. And how is he described here? Well, he's a forerunner. Later in the book, they're going to call him a captain. And we're going to talk more about it, but if you think militarily, a captain is a, a leader of his men that is first to go forward, typically, right? Uh, at least in the days that this was written, maybe not today, but in the days that this was written, it was always the captain that went first, ahead of his soldiers. Forerunner. Uh, I think everybody knows what that means. Uh, on, on whose behalf? On our behalf. So all we're, we're not even doing the work. And again, another picture. Think about it. We talked about the anchor, but now we've got this forerunner that's going into the inner place. We can follow, right, but only by him going before us. The work is easy. The work is done. That's the waiting patiently. That ties back up to waiting patiently. We don't have to do all of this. And so I hope that this brings some encouragement to you wherever you find yourself because what we're going to talk about is why is, why is his being referred to as Melchizedek so significant? And read ahead. And if you, wanna, if you wanna read ahead, that's great, but also go back to, uh, I think it's Genesis 22, and, and read a little of the history of the, of the relationship between Abraham and Melchizedek, if you'd like, and we'll pick up on this, uh, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. Um, any comments or questions um, before we close in prayer? Yes, sir. Never. I think you're exactly on the right track. You, you got to remember that. I mean, if you would turn with me real quickly uh, across across the a page, look at chapter 10, verse 39. Uh, excuse me, that's not right. Chapter 8. Now uh, he's going to talk about um, Jesus's work as high priest, but I, I think really this verse right here is is a central theme to what the author's trying to convince them of, which is, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. What's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanquish, vanish, excuse me. And, and so your point is, is think about these people reading this. We would never think about going into the Holy of Holies, would we? I mean, you know, it's like a child saying, I'd never, ever go into dad's whatever, you know, there were certain things that they were never to go into my briefcase. They knew that, right? I, it's maybe a poor example, but the idea now is, is, that, is that they're being told something that is really bizarre that maybe they haven't really considered, is that they have access to God in a way that if they go back, they, they never have access, right? It's a very good point. Anybody else? Okay, well, let's bow our heads. Thank you for your time and attention. Questions? Let's uh, bow our heads and we'll close with prayer. Father, we thank you for your promises, particularly this promise to Abraham. Father, we thank you that you are uh, the living, true, holy, just, and righteous God who keeps, Lord, every word that comes from your mouth, so to speak. Uh, that your promises are indeed yea and amen. Oh, Father, let us be encouraged by this, wherever we find ourselves this day in the lives that you have called us to. Uh, let us be encouraged uh, to uh, have our faith strengthened in the work and person of Jesus as we get ready to explore it even more deeply in the weeks to come. And now, Father, please prepare us and please help us and please direct us in the worship of your name, which you are worthy of. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen.